as an investor, if you're doing a rental or doing a flip, you need to do X. And I've seen some just horror stories over it. Okay. Because, you know, they'll make you tear open window, you know, walls everywhere just to teach you a lesson. Even though you're just uneducated, you didn't know what you were doing. Or you relied yeah. on a contractor. They're also looking to gut rehab, really do a good job, put a Section 8 tenant in there, make it gorgeous so that no one wants to move out and no major repairs have to be done in the next 15 years. I would say that's one one blueprint. If you could stick in the 150 the $200,000 neighborhood, getting into trouble with finding a tenant who's going to pay and not become an issue is greater than if you're in neighborhoods that have board ups and you know just have the kind of problems that you'll have in neighborhoods. They like 21215, they like 21229 Edmondson Village above Edmondson Avenue. Above Edmondson Avenue. Right, above Edmondson Avenue. Again, a lot of people like 21216. If we had not bought 20% of the houses that we bought, we would have worked a lot less and made more money because of course those 20% you shouldn't have bought are the hardest ones, the ones you never make money on, and the ones you're sorry that you bought. Hey investors, it's Dave Hathaway on the show where we talk about real estate, investing, and building wealth. I have a super exciting interview today and we are going to discuss the hottest neighborhoods in Baltimore for investors right now, up and coming neighborhoods in Baltimore, the biggest challenges to find investment properties in Baltimore, predictions of where Baltimore market is headed, where investors fail, and the best way investors can make money in Baltimore. So everything real estate Baltimore. And to do that, I want to tap into an experienced and seasoned professional, Kathy London, who has 33 years of experience in real estate, over 300 renovations, She's owned rentals and currently owns rentals, local real estate agent to the greater Baltimore, Maryland area, works mainly with investors to buy and sell properties, and just an overall really super hard worker in general. And I've had the pleasure of working with her on several transactions. Welcome to the show, Kat. Why, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Yeah, I'd like to start out and just get you a brief background of how you ended up getting into real estate. Can you share that with us? Absolutely. One day I was driving down uh, Erdman Avenue and there was a sign on a real estate company that says, come in, talk to me about real estate. And I actually pulled into the parking lot and walked in and met John Kleinberg, who was the first agent that I sat down with. And this is in 1991, okay? And he was telling me about the HUD list which was in the newspaper on Sunday and all the deals that you could get buying from HUD. And literally within a week or two, I put two contracts in on two HUD homes that I ended up closing on right at the end of 1991. And then I was hooked. Okay. And it's interesting because the minute he explained real estate to me, a light bulb went out over my head and I absolutely knew this was what I wanted to do. Okay. And so I just start, I, it was really weird because like five years earlier, I actually took a real estate course so that I could become a realtor, but I had it on hold. So he was, he ended up deciding to ha have his own firm. And then like a year later, he opened his own firm. I ended up going and moving with him and having my license activated. And then I just started buying properties. I only became a realtor in order to find properties for my family to renovate and resell. So that was the motivation. And that's why I became a realtor to start with. Awesome. And have you all have, have you grown up raised in, in Baltimore? Where did where where did you grow up and why, why yeah. Baltimore? Yeah, I grew up in Baltimore. I grew up in Pikesville. Um, okay. so I've been here pretty much my whole life. And uh, you know, no one was really talking about real estate a lot when I was growing up. It was not a conversation. As a matter of fact, when I started in 1991, no one was doing, you know, there was so few people. There was Jim Stein, there was Bill Fell. There was just a couple of people who were doing this, of course, Phil Collector. So it was really at the beginning stages of what I consider the incredible investor movement that has been going on over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, maybe 10 years. So I saw it when nobody was doing it. And what was great about being a realtor back in the day, you know, once or twice a week, all brokerage firms used to get a stack of all new listings. And there was no place like a Zillow where you could go online. And so what would happen is if I saw a house I wanted to buy, I could get it under contract anyway. So that's basically it. It was like a whole different world. Gotcha. What? And you, you started out just renovating properties and, and reselling them. Is that Correct. right? 
Yeah, we were buying properties, a lot of them in West Baltimore. Yeah, we were buying in West Baltimore or really anywhere we could find it, East Baltimore. Um, we were really looking at houses we were buying. You know, they could have been anywhere from, you know, 15,000 to 30,000. And then I remember we bought about four or five houses in Hamden for 18,000 to like 29,000. Okay. Yeah. And those houses, I mean, one of them we had that was on that Christmas block that you hear about where yeah. every year people put Christmas lights. Well, I had a property there. I don't know. Maybe I bought that one for 35 or 40. Um, but yeah, we were renovating them and, uh, we got to the point where we started at maybe three, then five a year, then seven a year, then 15 a year, then 20 a year. And then at the highest, my husband was renovating like 45. I think we did 45 on our biggest year, which was like around 2005 or 2006 before the, yeah. you know, the, the, the horrible thing of 2008. Yeah, that is awesome. And awesome that you are very early. Would there be anything differently that you would have done? Like looking, would you have held all those properties? I mean, listening to like 18,000 or $30,000 in Hamden property is, is a, a pretty sweet deal. You're not finding that now. No, you certainly are not. Well, what would I have done differently? Okay. Well, what I tell other investors who make mistakes is 20% of the deals I bought, we should have never bought. And if I had been smarter about the numbers, I don't know. I have like maybe a, a personality, like I got to buy, I got to buy. So we you call know. that a deal junkie. <laughs> so yes, a deal junkie. A and, and all a lot of investors are deal junkies. So there's no, no shame in that game. Right, exactly. So if we had yeah. not bought 20% of the houses that we bought, we would have worked a lot less and made more money because of course those 20% you shouldn't have bought are the hardest ones, the ones you never make money on and the ones you're sorry that you bought. So I would say to anybody, really know your numbers and always put an additional 15% renovation cost because there's always things that are going to show up that you're not expecting. So just have money for it. So that would be my best piece of advice from mistakes that I make. Yeah, I like that. Simplify your operations, purchase less, but make more. I mean, yeah. <laughs> sage advice. Was there a specific criteria when you used to like purchase that you were looking for? Would you look for like, hey, we're only purchase if we think we can make 15 or 20,000. Was there a specific number that you guys always tried to hit? I would think that probably in those days, because we were, we were reselling, if we were buying like 18, we were reselling for like anywhere from 39 to 59. Okay. And it never occurred to us just to buy a property and then to resell. That was never a thought of ours. It was always just to buy it and fix it up and then sell it to a homeowner. That was like the only thing I knew. Okay. I was that, so we did it over and over again. I'm sorry. What did you, what did you ask me? And did I answer you? No, no. I, so I asked, I asked if you had an initial and you did answer it. I asked if you had an initial target of like what you guys were trying to make on those properties. I'd say we didn't make much more than 15 on most of them. Okay. Gotcha. And that, I mean, this were this is hindsight and this is looking back. So $15,000 back then was a more than $15,000 in today's exactly. Uh, money. Exactly. And when you are working with investors kind of on a daily basis now, are there some like super hot neighborhoods that you see investors that are, they're really amped up in Baltimore to purchase? Well, so, okay. This is a very multi-pronged question. The first yeah. thing is, what I find so interesting, because I send out about 10 different opportunities a week to investors. What is surprising to me is that I rarely get more than two people calling me about any one property. So it's amazing because everybody has a different blueprint of what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's certain hot neighborhoods that I would say if I was going to say anything, I would say people are looking for rentals in neighborhoods that are at least 150000 to 200000 because yeah. they're more stable neighborhoods. What they're also looking to do is they're also looking to gut rehab, really do a good job, put a Section 8 tenant in there, make it gorgeous so that no one wants to move out and no major repairs have to be done in the next 15 years. I would say that's one one blueprint. I've got people that want the properties under 50,000. They don't care. Some of them under 20,000, you know, they have a game plan. I don't quite understand it. I don't have to, but I know who those people are and they obviously have a way of handling tenants that doesn't really hurt them, you know, because 
the lower priced properties, you have tenants who have more problems. I mean, the less money you make, if you have a problem, you're easily affected immediately. Whereas if you have some sort of cushion, you know, you're not going to not be able to pay rent immediately. So as far as the neighborhoods, I would say if you could stick in the 150 to $200,000 neighborhood, getting into trouble with finding a tenant who's going to pay and not become an issue is greater than if you're in neighborhoods that have board ups and, you know, just have the kind of problems that you'll have in neighborhoods, you know, that are going into disrepair. Do you have any in particular, I'm going to put you on the spot that you like, like, would you say like Hamilton fits this book or... Mid Govins fit this book or well, it's so the bulk of the people who I work with are keeping their properties as rentals. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm a salesperson. I can make more money if I sell to someone who's keeping a rental than if I'm selling it to someone to do a rehab. So and again, the people who buy from me buy from me over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. So I tend to sell one out of every 12 deals is a fix and flip and 11 out of 12 go to people who are buying and amassing them with no uh, plan whatsoever of selling these properties. They are planning to keep them and put a tenant in there and and sort of, sort of, that's the way they want to go. I mean, so people want to renovate. I got a lot of people who like 21217. There's a lot of really nice areas like Bolton Hill, Reservoir Hill. I just sold a house about three weeks ago on Utah Place. It's an eight bedroom, three bath property. And uh, they're worth like 550 over there. And then I've got properties. Of course, I don't sell a lot personally of Canton and Patterson Park, which is also very good areas. I just don't know why I don't, but it's just not where I do a lot of my business. I sell more row homes because then you don't have to worry about mowing lawns and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, people... It's just easier in that respect. Also, um, you know, a lot of people like zone 39, 21239. They like 21215. They like 21229 Edmondson Village above Edmondson Avenue. Above Edmondson Avenue. Right, above Edmondson Avenue. Uh, Again, a lot of people like 21216. I do do have some flips sometimes in 21216. Uh, Bel Air Edison, people love that. There's two parts of it. There's the four by four, which are those small three bedrooms. And, you know, I still get a lot of people that want to sell over there and buy over there. But of course, the other part where they're the bigger three bedrooms, you know, that are from like the 3500 block on up in Edmondson Village, not Edmondson in Bel Air, Edison. It's really people love that and have lots of properties over there that are rentals. Mm-hmm. And um, what else do I want to say? What other... Zone 15 is very different depending on where you are in zone 15. What, when got, you're saying zone 15, I'm sorry to stop you. I, I mm-hmm. don't know. <laughs> I purchased properties in Baltimore. I don't know what you're meaning when you're saying zone 15. What does that mean? You mean 21215? Okay. So when you say zone zone 15, you're talking about 21215. Yeah, exactly. Just like if I say 29 or I say 21217. Okay. So, and 13 is uh, Edmondson Village. Okay. Gotcha. So a lot of people like, 21215 and there's like three different neighborhoods kind of like 21218 there's like three different sets of neighborhoods there so if you just say are you buying in 21218 well that's three different types of neighborhoods all in one zip code yeah um but so 15 is kind of like that because you've got really neighborhoods that need a lot of work to turn around you've got the pimlico area which has gotten lots of good uh comps recently three years ago you couldn't give a house away over there but I think a couple of wholesalers came in there or, or renovators came in there, started renovating a bunch of properties, some developers, got some good comps. And then good comps bring other renovators in the neighborhood to bring more good comps into the neighborhood. So because there's so much renovation going on in Baltimore City, there is just a lot of action improving neighborhoods. Okay. Yeah. okay. Sometimes I feel like investors purchase properties over a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars because of the financing piece. And if they're purchasing under fifty thousand dollars or under a hundred thousand dollars, they have a tough time getting financed. So getting that DSCR loan, because a lot of people, a lot of the lenders are saying, Hey, it's gotta be, I've got to lend you a hundred thousand dollars or more. So mm-hmm. it's much harder to scale a portfolio. At least as much, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's much harder scale portfolio if you're purchasing all $75,000 row homes because you either have to package them together to get a loan or you have to go hard money route. You can't normally you don't can't get the DSCR 
loan for you know something that's a very small amount. But so what my people do is I would say that most of my deals are either cash or hard money. Okay, all the, and you'd be surprised how much cash there is. They buy them, they fix them, and they refinance them out. Mm -hmm. and they do it over and over and over again. And of course, when some of the terms have changed with the loans, they couldn't pull as much out. It slowed things down. You know, the interest rates going up has made deals difficult. But I got to tell you, in the last two months, I'm selling anything that's halfway decent almost immediately. I mean, there is such an interest in buying in Baltimore right now that, and, I, and I'm always selling to people internationally and out of state. I mean, that's not anything new. Yeah. But the amount of money that is coming into Baltimore, and I think it might be the last cheap place to buy on the East Coast. And I think that's part of it. Okay. But there's really any deal that makes any sense whatsoever. I try not to send out deals that I don't think make sense. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll get be pressured by uh, a seller who I do a lot of business with. Oh, try this anyway. And I'm like, it's really, a, it's not the right price. I had that conversation this morning with the seller. I uh -huh. said, this is what it's worth. And they wanted like 25,000 more. I'm like, it's, you were crazy. And he said, well, you've done things for me before. I couldn't believe that you could do it. I'm like, I know I am your hero, but you know, <laughs> every once in a while, I have to tell you you're crazy. And so that, that's another. I, I wanted to go in because this doesn't come up very often and it's specific to Baltimore and right. you, you touched on it. And I really want to take a deep dive because I've noticed it. There'll be certain blocks that get a really awesome comp and they haven't gotten that comp before. And you'll see like somebody come in where most of the times the property is selling for 150 and then you get a comp for like 350 on the block. Mm -hmm. And then you start seeing investors kind of purchase and do these super high end renovations. Right. And can you speak to that at all? Like, um, you, I don't like that doesn't happen anywhere else. And I, I think there's a huge opportunity, but just, can you explain that just a little bit more so people can kind of understand what's happening there? Well, there's a couple of developers in Baltimore and they'll do a gut rehab in it. And then a lot of times they will sell the property to somebody in California, for example, and they'll property manage it and they'll put in like section eight or a program that guarantees the rents mm -hmm. and they will stay on so, and they can get a much higher price. And maybe they don't need, like maybe it's a cash buyer who doesn't yeah. need financing but likes the idea that this is a gut rehab. They have a very good experience. They, they do a property management for a lot of, a lot of uh, properties. And so they make those comps in the neighborhood. They're the ones that have made the comps. Okay. Something like that will happen. Then another thing that happened, I sold a house uh, two weeks ago where there's a neighborhood housing association that is buying up a bunch of them in that block and the block before it. So, so what she said to me is, Kathy, every comp you've given me are comps that we did. Sell me the house. And I said, well, I think I, I would love to if you'll go up to this price. But if you won't, I think I can get more. And I did get more for the yeah. property. So there's neighborhood housing services that come in to try to stabilize the neighborhood. We'll bring in a lot of comps. And then people like myself see the comps and say, hey, OK, you know, let's capitalize on this. And the person who's going to buy it for me is the person who's going to renovate it, either put a renter in there and, and improve it, et cetera. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, it does. It a little bit more background for when a community association, let's say, are you talking about like a Bel Air Edison community association comes in and like purchases a bunch of the properties on the same block? Are they then just uh, giving a subsidy to ha try to get homeowners in there like hey i'll give you a first time home buyer credit to get homeowners in this neighborhood to stabilize is that what you're talking about i think it's more that it's a nonprofit, so it doesn't matter how much money they make they're probably losing money on every deal mm -hmm. okay but they're doing it because they're trying to accomplish something bigger and it's non-profit so you know like i just sold a house uh right by coppin state mm -hmm. uh to a neighborhood housing association that only buys on certain blocks around coppin in order to you know stabilize that area so they have specific directives and specific blocks only that they are going to invest invest in and nothing else yeah i love that i love that you have such a unique perspective that's why i really wanted to chat with you because you have such a unique perspective um and intimate knowledge of like baltimore i didn't know you grew up there 
Mm -hmm. uh, but then working with different associations, it's just awesome. What, the past five years in Baltimore, how have you seen it change and where do you think the direction is going? Well, when during COVID, when interest rates were low, I never did as well. It was the best time of my life because, you know, people were buying a lot of investment properties. Mm -hmm. Properties that we sold for 45,000, the same property would now go for 90,000. I mean, the values have gone up so dramatically since COVID. Now, so the first two years, like during COVID, real estate just took off and went crazy. And I mean, I sold so many houses, it was insane. And then when interest rates creeped up, it really slowed everything down. Mm -hmm. But then, like I said, in the last two months or the last three months, anything I can get my hands on that I send out, that makes sense at all. I can sell within a day or three days or a week, okay? So even with rates as high as they are, it has not stopped the appetite for people buying in Baltimore, okay? Mm -hmm. But you also have to be aware if you're buying rentals in Baltimore that the judges are very pro-tenant and very not pro-tenant, pro-landlord. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what you're doing, you'll call me in two years and say, Kathy, can you help me sell that house? Which happens all the time. I say to my husband, I might get this one again, or I've gotten it. I can remember this one a few years ago. Here it is again. So I get a lot of them again from people who, you know, just can't, if you can't do it right in Baltimore and you don't know what you're doing, it's very easy to, to have problems. Yeah, no, you definitely need a super localized team in Baltimore. I don't think you can not have people that know it can't just be numbers. I right. think that if you're only doing the math, which the math is great, but I just, it's hard to math in like vacancy rates in certain neighborhoods or how block by block Baltimore really is, where you can have an amazing great comp and then across the street it can be like the biggest drug area right. and so you're not going to if you purchase a property maybe the numbers look great but you're not going to get a tenant in there because people are going to see what you would have seen if you would have drive down the block right. and go, wow they're just they're openly selling drugs and mm -hmm. here no one's going to rent this property no one in their right mind and then maybe the drug dealer that's selling the drugs here so they can live where they work um, right right and so it's always interesting yeah. to me but you do have to be have a super localized team that knows what the heck they're looking for in Baltimore. It can't just be like, oh, I manage properties in DC. I can, yeah, I can manage your property in Baltimore. Well, um, people are very specific and a lot of people, you know, you want someone who has a lot of experience in Baltimore, you know, and the other thing that I caution people about, I mean, I do it myself. So I bought a bunch of properties recently. The minute I buy them, I put in a simply safe alarm system. Hmm. Because squatters in this town are insane. I mean, there's just so many. I, I told my husband a year ago, I think it's her, I think it's Baltimore's answer to homelessness. Climb in a window because you don't see homeless in Baltimore. OK, and they make it very difficult to get people out of here. So yeah. I make sure that I secure the place. I put a sign on every door. Call realtor for alarm code. Even if I don't have an alarm code, I put it on there. Yeah. I want to do anything I can possibly do to dissuade someone from climbing in my window. And I do simply say for $28 a month, I move it from house to house to house, you know, and it's the best insurance because then, you know, if anybody's messing with it and for some reason I haven't had problems. Now I'm not, I'm also being careful. I'm, you know, not buying in a, a neighborhood that I think is going to be as much trouble, yeah. but I don't want to take the chance. The heartbreak of having a squatter move into your property is just horrible, you know? And so I would tell anybody, please put an alarm system the minute you own the house in order to insure your house. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely lots of different stuff you can do and lots of like dead giveaways for investors that when you're renovating, put all your trash out right in front of your house. Put cardboard mm -hmm. boxes in your windows. That's the number one thing that you're going to get your house broken into. Right, exactly. Know you're, exactly. You're renovating. And I see it. I just start, start laughing. I get frustrated at, my, at the contractors that I work with when they do it on my properties. Like, hey, guys, you know we put up right. curtains in the first floor window. Why are you putting up right. this cardboard box? Oh, I couldn't find the curtains. I'm like, you're going to get the house broken into because they're going to know, everybody's going to know that you are renovating. So there's definitely, I love that that tip about Simply Safe. My right. tip is always, put curtains up, at least people will have to guess if there's somebody in the property or not. And definitely right. don't put your entire renovation in your backyard or your front yard, because they're going to know when they see all your kitchen cabinets out there that you probably have new stuff in there. 
-hmm. And of course, who doesn't want a free fridge that they can just walk out the back door and break in the middle of the night? So, uh, but your Simply Safe idea is definitely great too, because that will yeah. stop it. And I'm sure, what do you have? The alarm goes off too when, some, when it detects. People. Yeah, if someone tries to break in or, or something, or there's a, you know, you get the simple, you know, just on the front door, basement door, or kitchen door. I mean, it's really very, it's probably about 200 bucks to buy the equipment. I have a guy in local that puts in the Simply Safe for me and moves it from house to house. And, you know, you have to have someone like that who can help you do whatever you need to do. I have them change locks for me. I have them break into houses and change locks. You know, I have I have sellers from out of state. I don't have a key. I haven't been there in 10 years. Yeah. Well, you don't mind if we change the locks. Why do I care? You know, so you have to have boots on the ground. You can do anything you need them to do. Yeah, I love that. I know, I noticed you said earlier about like the num with the numbers are right, the houses are flying off the market. What right. do you mean exactly? And and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna set this question up. What should investors be looking for? for rentals or flips? And what do you mean by the numbers are right? Well, I don't always know what that answer is because I can't believe what some people buy. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna just say that. Sure. So they need to know their numbers. Like they'll ask me, how much would it cost to rehab this? And I always like, I throw it back on them. I'm like, I don't know what you're doing. You know, you have to know your numbers, okay? But I deal with a lot of so smart people that just know. They just know everything, you know, to the dime. Yeah. And so I don't know whether I can answer that question great for you. Is, um, it, a, is right. it a cash flow thing that, that you think, hey, this property cash flows and it's in a decent neighborhood? Is it like a return on investment? Is it, is it, a, is it a, you know, hey, you just have the ARV. Like, hey, as long as you have, you know, your renovation and your purchase cost and you have a 50K buffer, it's a good buy. Yeah, I think I do it like for me, I mean, to, Maybe not the smartest way, but it's not. It also works. Is I look at what other people are buying. I mean, I sell so much, so many houses that I already know what sold. Like, oh, I sold one around the corner like a week ago or a month ago. Yeah. And then I, I go on multiple lists, and then you know, I just, I just know. I mean, I just kind of know. And so, and and here's the other thing. Like I told you, when I send out a deal, it's not like twenty. And I have thousands of people who look at our stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I have like a, a lot of people who can give me feedback yeah. and the only two people usually call me and one of them will buy it because we also do video walkthroughs of all of our properties uh -huh. and a ton of pictures. Cause I'm not trying to cheat anybody. I want everybody to see everything that's gross or good about the property. When they call me, they know whether they're interested. I don't need to talk to 20 people who only saw four pictures. You know, if you're going to sell things, you got to do a good job. You got to be prepared and have all this stuff. And then I rely on them to have their contractor look at it. You know, most of these are on lock boxes, or if not, you know, they've seen enough that they can have a pretty good idea what it's going to cost to fix. And that's, I mean, I just think being prepared. I like to, I won't send anything out normally before if it's rented, I get the leases, the lead cert, the city registration, you know, all the things you make it so easy for me because you're a really prepared seller. I don't want to waste my time finding someone who's ready to buy, and then the seller won't give me anything I need. So I tell the sellers up front, I need all your information because I know I'm going to get people calling me and I don't want to have to hunt you down later. So I also have rules that I have for the people who are giving me properties to sell so that I can do a good job for both sides. So yeah, th uh, thank you for that compliment. I appreciate you. <laughs> you're very welcome. You're a great uh, I mean, seller. Be being organized is definitely a, uh, a forte and it's definitely developed over time, but definitely for Baltimore city, I mean, having your lead certs, or if you have a rental license, you need all these mm -hmm. things or else it becomes difficult because usually at least sophisticated buyers or any buyers that have bought a per property in Baltimore and have been right. burned over certain things like uh, mm -hmm. use of occupancy, like, Hey, you have a, you have a violate, you have a vacant notice. Uh, vacant right. notice right. is a big thing that people out of state that don't really know. And they're like, Oh, it's no big deal. And it's like, that's oh, kind of a big deal. Yeah. Like a Baltimore inspector is going to have to come in your property if there's a vacant notice right? and you might have to pull a ton of permits and they might make you open up walls. You, it, and I always call it like, it's like a lottery. Like mm -hmm. you don't know who you're going to get as a Baltimore inspector. It could be super nice. It could be somebody that's having like the worst day in the world. It could be an educated person or it could be an uneducated person that's going off of not even stuff that's in the code that they're just right. like, Hey, I'm feeling that this isn't safe. 
Right. Like, well, your feelings are not part of the Baltimore City code book, but it's just so important. And that goes back to the localized team that you had mentioned before of like, right. hey, if you don't have a localized team, then these things might come up and you're going to go, oh, shoot. And then you're going to be, you'll be, you'll get your Baltimore education. Who do you think is the most important team members that investors need when they purchase, you know, a property? If they're purchasing their first property in particular, what are, what are like their biggest team members that they're going to need in Baltimore? Well, you have to have a good contractor unless the house doesn't need any work. I mean, I do sell houses all the time that have already been renovated and don't need work, mm -hmm. but if they do need work, then you need to get especially if uh, you need a full permits, you need to make sure that they've got a license. Okay. So, you know, that's a biggie. And the other thing is, you know, like you were talking about the biggest problem I see with people who are pulling licenses, I mean, pulling permits is they forget the, the first one, which is, I can't remember the word right now, but you know, you have to, what's the word, you know, before you do anything, you have to put it between the walls and the, uh, I'm having a senior moment between the walls and the I'm framing, sorry. you know, it's the insulation. No, oh, the insulation. Oh, I, I can't tell you how many times I have, there's a problem. There's a vacant violation notice and they've done everything and the house is gorgeous and they didn't pull the insulation. The insulation, you're not going to get a, a use and occupancy without the insulation. Now, depending on what jerk you get, I'm sorry, it's the inspector because some of them yeah. are the worst. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, they'll make you tear open window, you know, walls everywhere just to teach you a lesson. Even though you're just uneducated, you didn't know what you were doing or you were yeah. on a contractor. But that is like one of the things that I've seen happen over and over again. That's the first that's the first thing they want you to, to have done. Have you ever had that problem <laughs> or heard of I have not have to, I've not had the insulation issue uh, right. of somebody. I mean, I've definitely had contractors that are not going by the code book. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I normally just do what they want, unless it's just absolutely absurd, mm -hmm. even though I'm like a super principled person where I'm like, man, this is just not right, but yeah. I'm just going to do it because they're asking and I don't feel like making a fuss. You, but, they won't do it. Look, it doesn't matter. You can make a fuss. They still won't pass it. Well, you have to do this. Or I had an electrical inspector one day. He had to look at something on the first floor and the second floor. We asked him what he came and he said, well, something we did this and then he saw something else. He said, oh, you got to do that. And then we said, well, we have something else that we pulled permit on. We need you to go upstairs to look at it. I'm not here to look at that today. He wouldn't go upstairs to look at it, you know? So yeah. unreasonable, you know? It's tough. And a lot of times an electrical permit, an electrical inspector will come in and say like, oh, I see you did some plumbing. So you got to pull that and get the plumbing inspector out here before. I mean, it, it often feels like some people, I mean, this is across all fields. It's not just Baltimore inspectors. I know we're right. making on Baltimore inspectors. It's across all fields. Some people just, it feels like they don't want to do their job or do work. And they're just trying to just delay or put things off on maybe another inspector has to come out but neither here nor there right. Baltimore inspectors yeah, are tough. <laughs> yeah Baltimore inspectors are tough the biggest I mean to go off of that are there like really big mistakes that you see investors make I know you mentioned one which is hey you don't pull you know if you're doing like a housing housing permit and you don't do the insulation or you don't pull an insulation permit is there right. like some just big ones that you're like hey as an investor if you're doing a rental or doing a flip you need to do X and I've seen some just horror stories over it well I've seen horror stories about property managers Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, property managers. And when people want me to re refer one, I'm very much like, hmm. I, don't know, I mean, I, what I do is I have a list of lenders who are good and lenders who are horrible. And then I have property managers who are the worst, you know, but I, you know, I keep this list for myself just in case someone's yeah. selling me something. I just kind of, you know, keep all kinds of information. I've been told from other investors. Oh, I've had good luck with this one. I've had good luck with that one. And then, you know, but I really, I'll say here's three people who here's three property managers that I've had good success. Someone else has had good success with. I haven't, I've never hired them. You're an adult. You can talk to them. It's your job to, to, to decide whether you want them or not. You know, I'm yeah. not telling you anything other than someone else has told me they've had good success with them. Now do your job. Okay. If you got a bad property manager, that's very difficult. Because Baltimore City is tough, you know, you have to deal with getting somebody in into the property and, uh, you know, that's a good tenant. And then if you get a bad tenant, then everything's bad. Okay. The whole thing is, whole thing falls apart. So that would be, I'd say very, very important. The other thing is I have 
investors who will only do programs. And I have other investors who will never do programs. So it's not like doing programs is like the answer to everything in the universe. Yep. You know, some people just have had very bad experiences with the programs. In addition to the fact that once once uh, a tenant finds you and wants you, it could be 60 days of a house sitting vacant before you've gotten them in there. And then th those inspectors can make you do a bunch of piddly things that you wouldn't need to do for mm -hmm. anybody else in the universe. So, you know, everybody has, you have to figure out what your game plan is because it's not like a one one size fits all. You know, some people that everybody does something different. Like I said, unless I, I'll get a deal like every 30 deals where seven people will call me and I'm like, oh shit, I really, I really underpriced this one because people don't call me, seven people don't call me unless, yeah. you know, I've underpriced something. Okay. It's usually one or two. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know. That's just some things that I would, I'm thinking about. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to the, the team members. So you're definitely saying that having a really solid property manager, in addition right. to having a contractor, which which I 100% agree with you, especially property management just has so many different facets. It has the screening portion, which is huge, huge. It's only one facet of the whole thing. Then you have all the different documentation. If you have evictions, you just have to be very organized. And if you're not organized, or you just don't have good systems, you can have tenants that don't pay. And then the eviction process is painful in Baltimore. It's really, really long, epically painful. And don't ask me how I know, but it is epically painful. I mean, it's usually probably 90 days is like usually like the best case scenario of when you're, if you're filing, you go through all your processes, maybe slightly less than that, but that's painful, especially if you have, you know, you're paying a mortgage and you're not getting you know, not getting rent. And that's from when you start the eviction process. So usually the tenant wasn't paying before that. Right. So we're talking about 90. So yeah, property management is definitely a huge thing. I 100% agree with you. Do you have like a horror story that you could share that like what bad property managers have done in Baltimore? I mean, I think part of the problem is some of them don't do all the right paperwork. So when you go to evict a tenant, you know, you could be liable kind of in a way for not having all the paperwork. Like I, I don't remember exactly because uh, I work with a company who does a lot of evictions and they actually send me a lot of sellers who are now ready to sell because they've had their last horror story and they just can't handle it anymore. And I can't blame them, you know? And, and so I Is believe that they're, Rancor? yeah, it yeah. Is. I work with them a lot. Yeah. Okay. Is it Dana? Dana? Yeah. I work with Dana yeah, a lot. That's great. Okay? That's hilarious. Yeah, no, yes. it's fine. I mean, yeah, we use Maryland Rent Court. So if Baltimore, uh, if you're, you know, you need somebody to help you with evictions. Right, so I work with happy, Dana. Yeah, happy to share relationships. Dana has been good for us. So, but yeah, sorry, right. I totally interrupted you. I just, I no, mean, no, 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 right. Yeah, so yeah. Dana, has been, you know, whenever he's got a, someone who's looking to sell a house, he calls me. Uh -huh. And so, I mean, you know, there was this guy and he was trying to evict somebody, but their prior uh, property manager, and I know I could be getting this wrong a little bit, but didn't have a form. And then when they were trying to evict him, they were trying to sue him because he didn't have the right paperwork in place. I mean, it was really like, like an insane situation. And so I don't know all the paperwork because I don't get that involved. I just say, here's what I have. You're a big boy, you're a big girl. You know, I can help you. I can give you the names of people. I can help you with stuff like that. But I don't know all the nuances of this. And, and so I don't. But also, if you have a property you want to sell, you know, if you renovate it and want to sell it, I'm actually a great realtor. <laughs> so that's my plug for the day. But, you know, what I do is I get a lot of business from the investors I sell to, you know, I'm a familiar person and I answer the phone all the time mm -hmm. and I'm always willing to talk. And if I don't know something, I'll try to figure it out and, or I'll tell you who to call. And so I'm, I believe I'm a great resource for the people who I sell properties to. And, you know, it's a relationship that goes back and forth. They call me when they want to sell a house. They know what I'm going to do. They understand what I do, you know, it's no big secret. I'm pretty much upfront with whatever I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah. And, you know, I'm very good at the numbers and I know how to get it sold. So no, that is great. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of those things that, that you were just speaking of was, I mean, if, if a property manager doesn't pull a rental license, you're kind of screwed oh, yeah. fiction, then you got to go backwards. But I want to tap right back into what you just said. You said you sell a lot of properties 
I want to know your secret of selling such a high volume of properties. What do you have like a certain system that you use? How do you sell so many properties? Well, I was say... just grossly passionate about it and you're just obsessed with, with, with the deal junkie. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I'm a little bit, I've grown up, okay, a little bit in the last 33 years of, you know, making good mistakes and making, you know, I've had a lot of ups and downs in this business. In 2008, I was stuck with 12 properties and none of it was just very bad for a lot of us who were stuck in 2008. However, for me, I reach out to a lot of new people in the business who are trying to sell houses and I say to them, I can help you. I've been doing this for 33 years. Uh, let me help you with this deal. I have, I add a lot of value because I know a lot of stuff. I mean, over 33 years, I've learned a lot of things and then I deliver. Okay. So I'm not just giving lip service. And so I have a lot of people who have deals and all of my business is referral. Okay. I'm not spending any money advertising for people. All of my business is people calling me all day long. And when I, what I say to them, if you have a deal, Get, tell me what it is. Tell me about the condition of the property, where it's located, blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you how we can get it sold. And I say this to sellers. I So all my business is referral and it's a fantastic business. And once you've done your first deal with me, you want to do all your deals with me. Is that true, David? <laughs> that is true. Um, that is true. I mean, we've done, we're currently uh, have a property listed with you in process of being sold. And yeah, I mean, Baltimore is tough. So you gotta, I, what you're saying is that it's a relation what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. And so I agree with what you said, mm -hmm. but what, I, and I'm going to pull out what you said uh, to an objective measure. What I'm hearing you say, it's a relationship business and you've built a lot of relationships. And so that's why it it allows you to sell properties at uh, more properties than most agents would be able to take on and be comfortable with. Is, is that exactly. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's not just, you know, the relationships are continuing. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, once someone talks to me on the phone, they really understand that I know what I'm doing. And they have a high level of confidence and comfort talking to me. Because I'll tell you things you don't like either. You know, yeah. I'll tell you things you do like and you don't like. And I'm like, you know, I'm just trying to tell you because we're all trying to do the same thing, which is, accomplish whatever you're trying to accomplish. Usually and, it's make money. We're all trying to make money in real estate. Usually is the- uh, Right, but we're trying to accomplish something too. Like, yeah. you know, they're trying to be successful getting something sold. You know, there's there's more to it just than the money thing. How do I get this done in the most expedient manner that's gonna be, you know, the right way to do it? So that's what I tell people. And like I said, the other thing that is a pet peeve of mine is I work with agents all the time who never answer the phone. Mm. I don't know. Like I mean, I'm from a different generation, obviously, because I've been in this for 33 years. So as you know, I'm 39. I started when I was six. <laughs> but you know, I'm trying to say, you know, so you know, people who are younger don't answer the phone, and you know, I think that really helps me. I think that it's nice to know that if you're working with someone, you can reach them. I don't know. It's just something I. I I 100% agree with you. I think that yeah. is a competitive advantage. I think you're amazing at that. When right. I introed you on the this video interview and I said, you're super hardworking, that includes answering your phone or responding to emails while on vacation, while I'm doing whatever it is you're doing. And you're like, hey, I'm out here. I'm on vacation, but I'm going to handle that. I'm only on vacation for the first half of the day. This is actually Nemo. I'm on vacation for the first half of the day. The second half of the day is business even though you're still on vacation. Is that, was right. that, am I, is that accurate? <laughs> well, I go away a lot, but it doesn't stop me from doing whatever I need to do. Yeah, okay. And now, and you know, at this point I, I want to have fun. And again, I don't mind talking to people because that's my business. And it's not like painful. It's like, you know, this is what I do. This is part of what you do in order to make people, as they used to say, raving fans. You know, you want raving fans. You want people who want to come to you and want to know it's easy to come to you. Okay. I want to make it the barrier to entry to work with me is you can call me on the phone and three other people haven't talked to you, you know, and I keep in touch with my clients. They always know what's happening. You know, uh, you know, I just am a very communicative individual and, and I find that so many people aren't and I thank them for their bad business and I want to thank them and hopefully more people will come to me because of that.
Yeah. Is there a specific title company that you feel is like the best in Baltimore that you love to work with? Well, I work with two title companies all the time. And again, there is really a big difference between an investor title company and a non-investor title company. And uh -huh. an investor title company can still be good for not investor, you know, because I, but if I, I always pick either clear title group in Pikesville, anytime I call, it's like they act to me the way I act with people. They make me feel important. You know, if I'm giving you a lot of business, I better be important to you. And I expect you to answer my call and get back to me immediately and respond to me. And they do, they respond to me. And I also go ahead. Do you know who the contact there is, is that clear title? Oh, at Danny Steiger. Okay. Awesome. Danny Steiger. And I work with him all the time and they have a whole team over there. And I've been working with them for a long time. Awesome. Eastern, Eastern title and settlements. I also work with them over there. Uh, Rachel Carter is the contact person. They have two offices. They have a Baltimore office. They have a Rockville office. And what I like about Eastern is their, their attorney over there. I, I deal with a lot of difficult scenarios. Just some weird stuff constantly always comes up yeah. that just don't go through the normal things. And mm -hmm. Tom Geimer over there, who's their attorney, is just really smart at figuring out how to solve these kind of problems. OK, that other title companies would say, I can't do this deal, you know, and so he's oh, and he's not going to get title insurance for a title insurance company if it's not a legitimate response of how to handle it. He has a typical he just knows things. He's just very smart. So if ever I think something's difficult, I'll send it to him. But it isn't just that I give him a lot of stuff. I try to split my deals between the two of them. OK, awesome. and I like working with both of them. So it's like, you know. Whenever I go in there, you know, or whenever I talk to them, you know, it's important to feel important with the people you do business with. And they make me, you know, they respond to me and they really make sure whatever I need done is worked on. And that's some gold nuggets, but another good reason why you work with it. Uh, somebody like you that deals with investors, that there's more challenges than most. What you just gave was very golden nuggets for investors. I really want you to tap into what Kathy just said. She mentioned two title companies that she really likes to work with. And I'll speak from my own experience. I've worked with other people's title companies that I don't like working with. And they just say, hey, I can't do this because there's something on the title. And they just say, we can't do it. I say, uh, okay. Uh, and then you have to reach out to somebody like Clear Title or Eastern Title. Eastern title and settlements. And uh, settlement. yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. Up and coming areas. Is there any areas that investors don't totally know about that you're like, man, I kind of really like this area in Baltimore? Well, again, I think there's a lot going on in 21217. Okay. Right. A lot of like development. There's there's Upton in 21217. 21217 is huge. So I have a bunch of properties in 21217. Right. It's it's big and it encompasses a lot of things, but keep going. Right. Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, Upton in 21217, of course, there's, I think I, I sold a house on the 1500 block of, um, of Mc, what, what was it? McCullough? No. Wait, yeah, well, McCullough. I, I sold one. Well, actually, I'm selling one on Monday on there, but I, I had another one, Drude Hill, the 1500 block. It's like Marble Hill or something. I think that's the neighborhood. That's yeah. also a neighborhood that um, I sold that house like in 12 seconds. Okay. Uh, they're three stories. They're really nice looking blocks. You know, people have lived there forever, you know, wealth kept. These neighborhoods have like their four and five hundred thousand dollars after repaired value. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot going on over there. So, you know, more stuff is going on towards Drude Hill Park than, you know, you would have ever seen, you know, five years ago. So there's Reservoir Hill and. I would say that's a good area. I mean, a lot of people, the minute I get something in 21239, I sell it like in five seconds. Okay. Yeah. So that's another neighborhood that people just love, love, love. And, uh, but it's not up and coming. It's already there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say probably a lot of 17 that people are 21217, people are overlooking more than they need to. Now, there's some of it sh that should be overlooked. Okay. Is, you know, uh, and, Winchester Sandtown and 21217. I think it is. Yes, it I is. Know. Yeah. I mean, so, and, and there's some areas, there's some nice areas of that. I mean, I am a huge believer that you don't blanket a zip code. A larger investor, when I first started investing in Baltimore, 
told me I was a really dumb dumb for purchasing a two on two on seven. And I purchased mm -hmm. a four property package and they were all multifamilies. And I was didn't have a ton. I, I mean, I took his advice because I was like, oh, man, I did. I listened to his advice and made me feel really bad because I already had purchased yeah. properties. Mm -hmm. They were the most profitable properties I've had. I said, man, I'm glad I didn't didn't, uh, you know, didn't get his advice before I had it under contract and before I closed on the properties because I was like right. super nervous. Uh, but it just goes to the fact that you can't blanket a zip code. I really appreciate you sharing that two on two on seven. And there's some new developments going up in two on two on seven that they're selling for like three fifty on Harlem. I want to say the seven hundred block right. of Harlem or the five hundred block. They completely gutted an entire block. They're gorgeous, and you just don't get the same architecture in different parts of the city that you do right there. So you Correct. get some like super unique stuff, and I'll drive it. And I'll go, man, this is gorgeous. And to build the same thing, and I don't really talk about this too much, but you have the thing where to build the same property would be way more expensive than what it is already there to like do the brick work. It just would be right. exorbitant costs. So if you can get something for, you know, $150,000 and it costs 250 or $400,000 to build, I mean, you have, you're kind of insulated a little bit. Right. So, you know, like I'm selling a house on Monday, the one I was telling you about the 1500 block of McCullough, it's funny because this is someone who's bought for me before. He said, Kathy, I was supposed to, I wanted to buy a house, but I didn't, some other investor bought it on the 1400 block of uh, McCullough. I've been waiting for a house over here. I'm buying it. I'm going to fix it up and I'm going to live in this one, you know? So, you know, people are keeping their eyeballs open. So he was an investor, but this is something he wanted for himself and he had lost another opportunity you know, you lose an opportunity and then you look in the neighborhood and you're really paying attention to that neighborhood. It's happened to me before. I'm sure it's happened to you, right? Yeah. The same thing as if you purchase a house in neighborhood and you start to like that neighborhood, you'll purchase a bunch on the same block. So there's several blocks that we just have like a few properties on the same block and people right. are like, oh, you like that block? I'm like, I like that block a lot. So yeah. I got three properties on the same block and right. I'll purchase exactly. the rest of the block if I can. So I, I, I've noticed that with investors, you'll get really, cause you get comfortable with the rents, you get comfortable with the tenant base and you know, mm -hmm. like, oh man, this goes quick. Oh, I know my, no and, and then you don't have to look at comps. You are right, like right. you said, mentioned earlier, you have a lot of the comps. Right. And so when you're the comps, you become super comfortable with the areas and you're like, oh, I don't have to worry about like that person selling it for a lot or this or that, that person that's renting out for less. I know how much they rent for because I've rented them. What advice right. would you give investors that are worried about purchasing in Baltimore? They're just like, man, the crime. Do you have any, you know, what advice would you say if you're like, I'm thinking about purchasing in Baltimore, but it just seems like it's really rough when I drive around it. Well, don't drive around rough areas. I mean, that would be the first thing. I mean, there's, there's like two Baltimores, you know, there's, you know, there's the wire Baltimore and then there's, you know, cause that's a TV show, but there's some rough spots, but you know, you know, you can pick wherever you feel comfortable. I mean, I would say people will say to me, what should I buy? And I'm like, I don't know you. <laughs> I said, how can I possibly, you know, some people will say, would you buy this if you were me? I'm not you. I don't know what you want. You know what I'm saying? People say the funniest things to me. I, I mean, you, I say that if you're going to start in Baltimore, just find a neighborhood you like and get to know it well. Don't know everything. Find 21213. See if you like, if you like it there. Learn two one two one three. If you like, if you like Edmondson Village. Learn Edmondson Village. You know, you know. But see, I'm giving practical advice. A lot of people want the magic pill. Okay, they want you to tell them what to do, and you know, it's unfortunately like most things. You have to do a little bit of legwork before you're going to jump in and and do something. How would you recommend investors that might want to purchase through you? to intimately get to know those areas. If they want to intimately get to know like 21217 or 21213, what's the best way to do that? I mean, again, if you find a zip code you want to learn well, you can go on Zillow, Redfin, any of those places and start looking at rentals. There's also something called Rentometer. If you put an address in, you can go on Rentometer and then it'll tell you what typical rents are right around there. And then that's number one. The other thing is, like I said, you can go on Redfin or these other places, but you can also join our buyers list. Okay. Uh, our website is by Baltimore, B U Y Baltimore dot U S like United States. My we'll, son, go. we'll put it, we'll put it in the comments. So if you, uh, if you guys want to join Kathy's buyers list, we'll put a link in the comments, to this video. So definitely I encourage 
the students that I have to, to join Kathy's buyers list. So, Okay, gotcha. Because, I mean, we send out like 20 deals a week and we do it with, we have a certain way we do it. So we have all the information on the subject line. So if it's not an area you're interested in, or you don't want someone that's already, there's already a tenant in there, you don't even have to open that particular email, put it in trash, only look at the ones you want to look at, but you won't miss anything. Uh, our website, we update it every single day, except the weekends. And you'll start getting a rhythm as to what we're doing. We do video walkthroughs, we do pictures, we do comps, we do the write-up. I mean, you know, this will allow you to get good at getting an understanding of what the values are uh, while you're deciding what you want to do. I love that. Any other good ways to, to, to reach out to you other than joining your buyers list? Absolutely. If somebody has a property that they want to list? I mean, sure, yeah. sure. Uh, my phone number is 410-903-1558. And uh, it's all over the website too, <laughs> you know? So yep. it's well, Kathy well. London. And then I also have my own website, kathywantsyourhouse.com, where you can read my bio if you have any interest. But, um, you know, I'm always interested in talking to people. I will definitely steer you in the right direction. Got it. Thank you so much. We'll have all of Kathy's info down in the comment section. Guys, if you think that you disagree with Kathy's zip codes that she gave out as up and coming areas, you think we missed something like uh, we missed a zip code that's up and coming, definitely put it in the comments. We encourage feedback from, from the audience, from everybody. I do want to thank you so much, Kathy, for coming on, spending an hour with us, yeah. uh, giving us your, your experience, your education, and just thank you. I appreciate you. Well, thank you. And it was a lot of fun. Okay. All right. See you, Kathy. All right. See ya.